Uh, I thought that I had put a map out on the uh, uh, hard drive that showed uh, the extent of the Roman Empire. Uh, it's not out there, but let me just describe it to you. <clears throat> Spain, France, Italy, Asia Minor, North Africa, the world was made up of the Roman Empire. Um, a population of, um, so I think it was 80, 80 million people in the Roman Empire. And you saw all those wonderful roads that they had. <clears throat> the roads were very uh, helpful in establishing the uh, Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome, so that Rome was able to govern its whole world because it had these roads that it could uh, travel on, encourage commerce. And so <clears throat> if you go to the Holy Land, how many people have been to the Holy Land? Okay, how many have been to the uh, Turkey? Okay, so we've got some people who can speak from personal experience about some of these places. But to realize that the stones that you're walking on are as ancient as they are, uh, built uh, by the Romans, traveled by Paul, and are still in existence is to be a, you know, a rich, rich part of history, <clears throat> a wonderful uh, preserved part. Okay, we're going to be looking at uh, Paul's first missionary journey. And if you follow the uh, arrows, he starts out from where? Headquarters, Antioch. <clears throat> so he's over here in Antioch. And he goes over here to uh, Colossae, to Perga, up to the other Antioch in Asia Minor, over to Iconium, to Lystra, to Derby, um, and then he makes his way uh, back. His first trip is to Cyprus. Why do you think he's going to Cyprus? Because of who? Barnabas. It's his hometown. There's another hint that this is Barnabas' journey, uh, not Paul's. So he's going to go to uh, he's going to go to uh, Cyprus because uh, uh, Barnabas knows his way around uh, Cyprus. Okay, so they sail from. Uh, we're on item E, number one. Sail from Seleucia to the island of Cyprus, uh, and this is covered in Acts chapter thirteen, verse one to three. Paul is in his late thirties. He's in his late 30s. Oh boy, don't I wish. Late 30s. Um, this whole journey of his is 1,400 miles. 1,400 mile journey he's setting out on. The uh, island of uh, Cyprus is uh, 150 miles long by 40 miles wide. Not very big. And so there's all kinds of unanswered questions about how does he travel around? Who feeds him? Um, how does he get by? Um, he has to have um, food. He has to have transportation. He has to have some medical help, I would think, at some point. All of those questions are left uh, unanswered. But Cyprus is a center of commerce, so it's understandable why uh, they would want to go to Cyprus. Paul would typically head for something bigger. He'd look for a metropolitan city with what? What's the first place he's going to go to? A synagogue. And so uh, that's what he's going to be looking to do. So he goes to item two. He preaches at Salamis and at Paphos. He begins preaching in the synagogue to no opposition. He must have wanted to move in and stay there. No opposition. So he's preaching in the synagogue, effectively proclaiming that Jesus is in turn indeed the Messiah. The only issue that's ever raised is do you first have to be a Jew before you can be a Christian? That becomes the raging issue. 
He travels the length of the island and he ends at Paphos on the end of the island, which is the home of the uh, Roman uh, governor. Rome is very clever <clears throat> about managing all of these territories. They will accept uh, the governorship or the kingship of the particular uh, country, but they will put somebody in there to uh, make sure that order is maintained. The Pax Romana is only um, present where there is good order. So the, um, the Romans are very interested in uh, in keeping peace and order. Anybody watch the uh, video on the Bible? Video on the Bible? When the appeal is made to um, Pontius Pilate to do something about these rebels, they, they make the appeal this way. I don't think Rome would like to know about what's going on here. And that's the thing that perks up um, Pontius Pilate's ears. He does not want Rome to know that there are disturbances going on in Palestine. And that comes through pretty, pretty vividly. And they use that leverage with Pontius Pilate to go ahead and arrest Jesus and it goes on from there. But they threaten him with, <clears throat> when Rome finds out that these kind of things are going on here and you haven't done anything about it, it's not going to not going to do well for you. Because Pontius Pilate, I'm sure, wants to be promoted, right? The highest position you can have in one of the uh, <coughs> territories is to be governor, to be governor. Pontius Pilate is a, a procurator, so he hasn't arrived at the, uh, as a governor yet. Um, <coughs> so he goes to the uh, Paphos, the home of the proconsul, and he witnesses to the proconsul Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus was a member of nobility, a cultured and educated man. Now, a cultured and educated man hears about somebody who has an incredible story to tell. And so his uh, interest is piqued. He wants to hear from uh, this person as well. So he summons Barnabas and Saul to come to his residence. When, and item four, when they get to his residence, he's got competition. Paul has a story to tell, but there is someone else there, Bar Jesus, who is a uh, magician, who is uh, a fortune teller and a magician. And his name is Elimas and his name has more to do with his occupation than it has to do with his uh, lineage. He also is well educated, but he's also trained in the mystery religions. He's a magician. He's Jewish, so he knows the Jewish scriptures, but he's also um, studied the occult religions. Apparently Saul and Elymas are witnessing to Sergius Paulus. Saul, who is now going to be known by his Latin name, Paul, calls out the magician, and he calls him son of the devil. And so he says, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You shall be blind for a while. So Sergius Paulus, who is the uh, Roman representative, converts on the basis of uh, Paul's ability to confront this magician, to call him out, and to rob him of his uh, magical powers. Kind of reminds you of uh, the magicians that Pharaoh had, that when Moses went to, uh, to Pharaoh, he once again uh, proved superior to those. Um, so Sergius Paulus goes on from there to convert. He's now a Christian. Paul and Barnabas switch positions. If they're going to witness to Sergius Paulus, who would do a better job, this Jew, Barnabas, or this Hellenist Jew slash Roman Paul? So Paul comes to the forefront, and it's Paul who does most of the evangelization 
of, of him. And of course, we see now the development of this mission to the Gentiles. Suddenly, uh, Paul is addressing himself to a Gentile. Five, they sail from Paphos to Perga in Pamphylia. From Perga, Paphos, we're gonna go over here to Perga. And while he's at Perga, which is the beginning of the road over the Taurus Mountains. Now, what we saw in the video was uh, a lot of pretty straight roads. Now look what faces Paul. Antioch in Pisidia, not the Antioch that is in uh, modern day Syria, but that Antioch, 3,600 feet above sea level. How tall do you think this ceiling is? Maybe 30 feet, 40 feet? 3,600 feet above sea level, which means he's got to do a lot of climbing. I hope he has a, a mule or some beast of burden to get him up over that. And if you're going to go up 3,600 miles, you better bring a sweater or a jacket, right? So you can imagine the kind of things that he continues to run into that perhaps he hadn't anticipated. Iconium is 3,000 feet above sea level. Lystra is 3,600 feet above sea level. Um, Steve talked in his video about going up to Jerusalem. If you've been to the Holy Land, it is indeed up to Jerusalem. I will never forget going from Jericho, um, five or six hundred feet below sea level, the lowest spot on the earth, up 2,600 feet to Jerusalem. How do I remember that? The bus, just constantly shifting to get up to Jerusalem. So every time I read the scriptures and it says up to Jerusalem, ah, I remember up to Jerusalem. Uh, John Mark leaves now to return to Jerusalem. Something's happened, something's gone wrong. Is he homesick? Wants to get back to Jerusalem where um, you don't see Christians being ripped out of the synagogue and being able to establish their own um, identity? Is he longing to be back with Peter, since John Mark was a disciple of Peter? Is uh, climbing uh, 3,600 feet in snow and ice and everything else beginning to uh, get to him? In any event, we have no idea, but John Mark leaves to go home. So some kind of a falling out. Uh, number seven, on to Antioch of Pisidia. Pisidia is part of the Roman province of Galatia. Paul goes to the synagogue and he is asked to speak. Acts chapter 13, verse 13 to 16. Somebody read that? Acts chapter 13, 13 to 16. Uh, Paphos, Paul and his companions set sail and arrived at Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. They continued on from Perga and reached Antioch in Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they entered into the synagogue and took their seats. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent word to them, my brothers, if one of you has a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Wow, being invited to speak. Um, do you remember when uh, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he rolled out the scriptures and began to read, uh, the word of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bring good news. And this is the same situation handed the scriptures, he rolled them out, they read them, they read the, uh, the law and the prophets. And then they said, Paul, do you have anything to say? Here comes Paul. 
men of Israel, and you that fear God. Who is he talking to? You that fear God. Talking to the Gentiles who have no place to go to hear about God and to share with other people about the things of God. These are the Gentiles, the righteous Gentiles who are in the synagogue. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And Paul goes on to lead them all the way through the Old Testament up to the coming of Christ. And you can see them sitting on these benches in the synagogue, you know, kind of leaning forward as Paul is drawing them into this story, getting ready to close the trap. The promised Messiah is here, and it's in the person of Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. So, um, Paul provides this wonderful uh, summary of God's revelation. And so they are so impressed, they beg him to come back. Please come back next week. Well, he comes back next week, and guess what? Somebody has gotten to his audience and talked about Paul as being a troublemaker. Item eight, he goes from acceptance to rejection, conflict on the Sabbath. The next Sabbath, the whole city comes out and the Jews are jealous. Jealousy. Um, if they came against Paul because of what they believed, that's one thing. But to come in conflict because too many people are coming out to see that preacher, Paul. Not exactly the highest motive. But indeed, they come out because they see this uh, competition and people are listening to Paul. They're not listening to him, but other people are. Jewish leaders turn against them. We turn now to the Gentiles. That's what Paul says. Acts 13, 46 and 47. Who can read that for us? Acts 13, 46 and 47. Paul and Barnabas spoke out fearlessly, nonetheless. The word of God has been declared to you, first of all, but since you rejected it and thus convict yourselves of, as unworthy of everlasting life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For thus were we instructed by the Lord. I have made you a light to nations, a means of salvation to the ends of the earth. Okay. Um. They shake the dust from their feet and leave. Does that have a certain ring to it? Does that have a certain ring to it? When Jesus sent the disciples out, he told them, if you arrive at a place and they accept your message, that's fine. If they don't, what should you do? Shake the dust from your feet and leave. And so we have uh, Paul uh, imitating that. So they're going to leave and take the message to the Gentiles. Okay, item nine, on to Iconium with Jews versus Greeks, more conflict. This city is divided between Jews and Greeks. He wanted to do them harm, so they leave moving 20 miles down the road. Paul escapes again. He goes down the road to Laconia in Lystra and Derby. Lystra and over to Derby and to Iconium. These are cities dedicated to the Greek god Zeus. In Lystra, a miracle caused them to be deified. Paul comes across a cripple and tells him, stand up and walk. Hmm. Any other parallel for this on the part of a disciple, on the part of an apostle? Peter at the heavenly gate. Peter is asked by a cripple to give him money. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none. 
but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. So here we have Paul doing exactly the same thing. Another miracle. Barnabas they called Zeus. Paul they called Hermes. Population, because of these miracles, they want to deify Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas they call Zeus, Paul they call Hermes. Priests from the temple want to worship them. So Barnabas and Paul do something that would make sense to the Jewish community. They tear their garments, which is what the high priest did after asking Jesus, are you the Christ? Jesus answered, thou sayest it. Rips his garment. And so they tear their garments saying, look, we're only men. And it's through the power of Jesus Christ that we heal that man, not in our power. Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I say, rise up and walk. Uh, item 12, enemies from Antioch and Iconium kill Paul, kill in parentheses. They take Paul and they stone him and leave him for dead outside the city. That's it. We took care of that problem. Well, his followers go outside, lift him up out of the ditch. Um, he's restored to health and he goes on to preach in Derby, 60 miles to Derby down from Lystra. Back, he's going backwards now to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, and he's appointing elders, appointing elders. Doesn't every church need a leader? Doesn't every church have to have somebody whom the community can look to for answers? Who do we look to? We have a pastor. And so he wisely goes back and appoints elders in the church. And isn't it one of the great strengths of the Catholic Church that when there are issues that need to be resolved, particularly doctrinal issues, there's a way to resolve them. There are people in authority who can speak authoritatively uh, to the issue. It's not up to each of us to take the Bible and privately interpret it ourselves and say, look at what I have discovered. It is the church who can uh, make such a judgment. Now to Pisidia and Perga and Italia and on home. And where are they going back to? Going back to, when they say home, what do they mean? Amen. Going back. Okay, item F, third visit to Jerusalem and the first apostolic council, about the year 49. Judean Jews came to Antioch preaching circumcision. You have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Paul and Barnabas are appointed to go to Jerusalem about the question. So the community in Antioch select uh, Barnabas and Paul and send them on to Jerusalem about the raging question. Do you have to be a Jew before you can be uh, a Christian? Doctrinal issues require authority to resolve so they wisely go to the mother church, located today in Rome, but then located in Jerusalem. And there will always be doctrinal issues that need to be uh, resolved. We had a huge doctrinal issue almost 500 years ago that needed to be resolved. And it was resolved at the Council of Trent. Second Vatican Council was all about the church and its relationship to its people, its relationship to the world. It was a pastoral council. It didn't need to deal with the issues that the Council of Trent needed to deal with. 
Council of Trent needed to deal with something as fundamental as how are we saved? How are we saved? I preached uh, one uh, morning in my church in Beaumont, was saved by grace through faith. I got turned in to the pastor preaching uh, heresy, uh, Protestant, this is what Protestants believe, we don't believe that. Hello, we are saved by grace through faith, but not faith alone. Faith working through love. In other words, it's faith and works. And so um, this issue that has been raised needs to be solved by somebody. If you look at the uh, doctrines of the Council of Trent, you can see uh, if anyone says that the sinner, sorry, that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it's not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. And so the church clarified the position that it always held, but the Reformation caused the church to look at a lot of these issues and to resolve them. It's so easy to look back at that period of time and say, how could we have gotten into so much trouble? No seminaries. No seminaries. Per people weren't trained in seminaries. Um, bishops were, uh, in a lot of cases, political appointments. They weren't pastors. And so the church, um, there was a lot of um, recognition of the need for change in the church in the 15th century. Uh, it didn't come about, but it doesn't mean that there were, that it, that it wasn't an issue uh, for the church. It wasn't acted upon, it wasn't, um, it, the changes didn't come about. But the church was very much aware of things that needed to be changed. That's why we don't say the Catholic counter-reformation, like we're just responding to the Reformation, it's the Catholic Reformation, which was long understood but little acted upon. And so in uh, 2017, 2017 will be the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And so in the Lutheran Church and other churches, it'll be a day of great celebration. Um, it'll be a day of point of sadness to see the, the church torn apart over an issue which every year moves us closer and closer and closer and closer to resolution. Because now we have a joint declaration between Catholics and Lutherans on the issue of justification. Lutherans, now look, the informed ones, no longer believe that we are saved on our own, on our own works. I work my way to God. And so much of the uh, smoke and flame and hostility and everything that existed is melting away as we listen to one another. And the Joint Commission that worked with Lutheran theologians over, over a long period of time finally came to understand what each of us were saying. So when people are listening to one another, you can come away from that with something called the Joint Declaration, in which the Catholic position is clearly set out, the Lutheran position is clearly set out, and there's like a, a wafer-thin uh, difference uh, separating the two, as it should be. Anyway, uh, here's the big issue that's up for grabs in, uh, in Jerusalem at the First Council in the year 49. But it's important to recognize we've got this terrible issue. How do we, how do we resolve it? Uh, we go to the church, right? We don't sit in this room and knock our heads. We go to the mother church, which happens to be uh, in Jerusalem at the time. So this is a defining moment in Christian history. We are now distinct from Judaism and 
salvation is available to the whole world. For Jews, out of this, Pharisees are now allowed to uh, keep the law of Moses. They can continue to be circumcised Jews, but that does not apply to Gentiles. If you're a Gentile and you want to come into the church, you don't have to be circumcised or conform to, to uh, all of the hundreds of rules and regulations that uh, Steve mentioned in his video. So Peter makes his speech in Acts, Acts 15, 6 through 11. Can someone read that? Acts 15, 6 through 11. The apostles and the presbyters met together to see about this matter. After much debate had taken place, Peter got up and said to them, My brothers, you are well aware that from the early days God made his choice among you, that through my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of, of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness by granting them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. He made no distinction between us and them, for by faith he purified their hearts. Why then are you now putting God to the test by placing on the shoulders of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they. Peter rose. A whole lot of people there. A whole lot of people with uh, the experience of Paul and Barnabas who rose to speak. Peter, the head of the church. Brethren, you know that in the early days God made choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel. So indeed, the Gentiles are being converted, and uh, Peter bears that out. The next thing that happens is that they agree, how are we going to get this word out about this promulgation? We've solved this issue, what are we going to do? Enter uh, James. They uh, write a letter. Therefore, it is my judgment that we should not trouble those Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the pollution of idols, from unchastity, and from what is strangled, and from blood. For from early generations, Moses had had in every city those who preach him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogue. And so, a letter is written by the church. The letter is going to be sent out to the Christian communities, and everyone is going to understand doctrinally what it takes to be saved. Saved by grace through faith. And this becomes, it's not circumcision, it's baptism, which will identify you as a believer. Uh, item seven, Paul, Barnabas, Judas, and Silas. Judas and Silas belong to the mother church. So when they go to bring the letter to the church in um, Antioch, they send two representatives from the mother church. It's not enough to send Paul and Barnabas. They're going to send two people from the mother church that can be helpful in delivering the message as well. So um, they have a great celebration. The Gentiles are ecstatic about no circumcision. <clears throat> Painless to come into the Catholic Church now. No circumcision. Paul and Barnabas stay on while Judas and Silas, after they have performed their uh, purpose of uh, assuring people that this is the mother church uh, in supporting this. So after some days, Paul says, let's go back to the places that we visited. So Paul has uh, rested up a little bit. He's got the assurance of the community. We're now going to begin Paul's second missionary journey, this time 2,800 miles. 2,800 miles. He's about age 42, and it's about between um, AD 50 and 53. So let's take a look at our second map. 
So where are they going to set out from? Paul and Barnabas separate. Uh, the issue of uh, John Mark, John Mark is back in the picture and uh, they have a discussion about bringing John Mark along with them and Paul has a problem with that because John Mark fell off the wagon when I, when I had him at my last missionary journey so I'm not going to have him with him. So what happens is they split and Barnabas and Paul, his cousin, go to Cyprus Paul and Silas go through Syria and Cilicia. Barnabas to Cyprus, Paul through Syria and Cilicia. Item three, in Derby and Lystra, Timothy joins the team, but finds it a painful experience. Those are my comments. Why is it a painful experience for Timothy? Paul decides that it's in everybody's best interest that uh, Timothy be circumcised. His mother is Jewish and his father is Greek. So Paul uh, does not want to have to deal with the issue of, uh, well, he's Jewish, how come he's not uh, circumcised? What determines whether you're Jewish? Mother, are you the child of a Jewish mother? That determines what, whether you're uh, Jewish or not. So um, Barna, or, uh, Timothy, is, uh, Timothy is circumcised. Um, so at this stage, it's pretty well established. If you're, if you're a Jew, um, you can be circum circumcised and become a Christian. It's unnecessary for Gentiles. Gentiles can come in uh, without being circumcised, without prescribing to all the 600 regulations of Judaism. So as they visited, they delivered the decision of the Jerusalem church. So wherever they went to the Christian communities, they let every know, everyone know how this is going to be. They go on now to Phrygia and to uh, Galatia. So they're over here, I'm in Derby, on to, um, yeah, on here to uh, Galatia and the Holy Spirit has always directed Paul. Here we have again, where are we going to go? So he gets direct intervention from the Holy Spirit, tells him where he needs to go. No to the north, not up to Bithynia, or to the west, but cross over from Asia Minor to Europe. Wow. Number five, Paul's vision sends him to Macedonia and the capital, Philippi. Crosses over from Asia Minor into Europe. So for the first time, the gospel is going to be heard in Europe. Lands at Neapolis, goes over to uh, Philippi. That's because Paul has had a vision, a Macedonian man comes to him and says, we need to have the gospel preached to us. And so they make their decision by virtue of the intervention of the Holy Spirit, they go on to Macedonia. Philippi is the leading city in the province of Macedonia. It is staffed with many retired legionaries, uh, retired soldiers, Roman soldiers. No synagogue and few Jews. So Paul's got no synagogue to go to. So he learns, as we saw in the video, about a gathering place for the church. And guess who has organized this gathering place for the church? The women. So he meets with Lydia down by the riverside, which was a place for prayer. He meets Lydia from Thyatira, one of the seven churches of Revelation. She is a seller of purple goods, a very valuable uh, commodity at that time. So Lydia was a worshiper of God, a uh, righteous Gentile, someone who went to the synagogue, even though they're not Jewish, because they have no other place that can, they can learn about um, God and have fellowship with other people. She is what? Baptized along with her whole household. 
It is not making a profession of belief in Christ apart. It is baptism, which makes us a member of the family of God. Now, Paul comes in conflict with a fortune teller. He's beaten and arrested, always beating up on Paul. Going to the place of prayer, he's met by a slave girl. The slave girl was possessed. Paul exercises her in the name of Jesus Christ. Her handlers are economically threatened. You know, sometimes Jesus can be bad for business. If you need to live ethically and morally, you need to um, obey the commands of God, sometimes that's going to mean bad economic times. Paul is charged with what? Disturbing the peace. Uh-oh, the Romans, disturbing the peace. Cannot have disturbances. We're going to report you to, uh, report you to Rome. So he's thrown into jail, into the inner prison, and his feet are put in stocks. Item eight, the great escape. I don't mean Steve McQueen. The great escape. This is the same thing that happened to who? Peter, same thing that happened to Peter happens to Paul. An earthquake, the jailer becomes a convert and says to him, what must I do to be saved? And what does he tell him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So he is baptized along with his whole family. Presumably children in the family, right? So it's not just adults. So we have infant baptism being practiced as well. The magistrates get hold of them. Um, they're going to do them wrong. All of a sudden, Paul reminds them, excuse me, I'm a Roman citizen. Uh-oh, uh-oh. You, you can't beat and jail Roman citizens. So they need to back off from that. And when they see the error of their way, and they say, OK, release them, Paul says, no, I want the magistrate to come down here and release me. He's the one that put me in here. I want everyone to know that they illegally, illegally jailed a Roman citizen. Now, on to Thessalonica via Amephopolis and Apollonia. So we're going to go 100 miles from Philippi to Thessalonica. Thessalonica is another um, important um, spot, 100 miles from Philippi, and an, uh, another important city in, uh, in Europe. Back to the synagogue. He spends three weeks making his case for Jesus, Take it, walking them back, telling them about um, Jewish history and reminding them that Christ is the fulfillment of everything that the prophets and the law pointed to. The Jews were jealous and they went after Paul and Silas. They used the charge that they were challenging Caesar, another king. And this is the same thing that I mentioned in the, uh, in the video about the Bible. They're going to uh, they're going to tell the Romans that this man wants to be king. And he's going to replace Caesar. So you need to do something about it. On the Sabbath, an uproar in the synagogue. Number 10, on the Sabbath, an uproar in the synagogue. Uh, somebody read Acts 17, 1 to 9. Acts 17, 1 to 9. When they took the road through Amphipolis, and Apollonia, they reached Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Following his usual custom, Paul joined them, and for three Sabbaths he entered into discussions with them from the scriptures, expounding and demonstrating that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead, and that this is the Messiah Jesus who I proclaim to you. Some of them were convinced and joined Paul and Silas. So too, a great number of Greeks who were worshipers 
and not a few of the prominent women. But the Jews became jealous and recruited some worthless men, lottering in the public square, formed a mob, and set the city in turmoil. They marched on the house of Jason, intending to bring to them before the people's assembly. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city ma magistrates, shouting, these people have been creating a disturbance all over the world and have now come here. And Jason, Jason had welcomed them. They all act in opposition to the decrees of Caesar and claim instead that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city magistrates who, upon hearing these charges, took a surety payment from Jason and the others before releasing them. I have the uh, Revised Standard Version here, and it says, these men who have turned the world upside down. I want to read to you from uh, a document after the defeat of the British at Yorktown, which ended the Revolutionary War. If ponies rode men and grass ate cows and cats were chased into holes by mice, if summer were spring and the other way around, then all the world would be upside down. Song played by the British after their defeat at Yorktown. Why? The greatest army in the world had just been defeated by a ragtag bunch and to them, it was the world upside down. And what Paul and Barnabas have been creating is a new world upside down. We thought we understood it all. And here comes Paul turning our world upside down. So um, Let's see, number 10, on the Sabbath, an uproar in the synagogue, world upside down. Um, they used the charge, they were challenging Caesar. Once again, they needed to get out of town. Paul is always getting out of town. On to Berea, number, number 11. But here comes the Jews from Thessalonica. Boy, they just won't let him go. Where does Paul go? To the synagogue. He has a nicer crowd now than he had in Thessalonica. But the Jews from Thessalonica come and they start creating another disturbance. So he's got another get out of town on his hands. He now leaves and goes to um, Athens. So going to give up on uh, Thessalonica, going to Berea, and he's going to take this long trip down here to Athens. Paul, is, it, this is a 400 mile trip, and Athens was the leading city of the province of Achaia. The city was full of idols to Greek deities. It was a great center of philosophy and a great place for debate. Um, you, could, uh, you could find people who would debate issues of theology, philosophy, because of the Greeks' great um, desire for education for wisdom and for um, uh, intellect. Paul challenged to explain his teaching and he seizes on this idea of an unknown God. Paul comes across a, um, um, something that honors an unknown God. And like any good preacher, he seizes on this unknown God to tell them, it might be unknown to you, but let me tell you who it is that you worship under the name of this unknown God. So Paul finds this a great opportunity. When he finishes with resurrection, they're excited. They invite him back. This is terrific. Can you come back the next Sabbath? Now, some believed, including uh, two prominent people that he mentions. Now he's going to leave and go on to Corinth in the synagogue. Uh, he goes there with fr frustration, the capital of Achaia, large commercial city 
with a reputation. It's a seaport, and it's got a reputation synonymous with uh, loose living. So they have at least one synagogue. So he meets up with Aquila and Priscilla. They were kicked out of Rome by Claudius for disturbances. Paul shook his garments it's in frustration at these people. I'm now going to go to the Gentiles. Paul stays with Titius, Justus, and Crispus, the head of the uh, synagogue. 15, by a vision from God, he stays for a year and a half. Wow, that's a long time preaching in one uh, synagogue, but he stays for a year and a half. He has a vision. His vision is, tells him, be not afraid. So he stays 18 months after his teaching. Be not afraid. Who was the last prominent person to say that? Pope John Paul II stepped on the balcony. He's just been made Pope. And he says, 1.2 billion Catholics, be not afraid. Don't, don't worry. Can you imagine being elected Pope and, and stepping out in the balcony and telling everybody else, don't be afraid when you've just, you know, assumed this awesome responsibility? But John Paul II knew that I speak not from my own uh, capacity, not from my own um, ability, but I speak because God, through the hand of the church, has selected me, and I'm here to tell you, be not afraid. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. Be not afraid. Um, so he stays for 18 months. He is brought before the tribunal, and the proconsul will have no part of it. The proconsul Galileo dismissed the uh, issues that have been brought to him. And the proconsul says, wait a minute, what is this all about? And he said, well, it's all about um, the issue of uh, salvation. And he scratches his head and says, uh, you know, what's that got to do with me? That's a religious matter. You, you folks work it all out. And so they dismiss him, but not before they beat him. He tells them, work this all out, but they still give him a beating before they let him go. So now he goes back to Antioch with Priscilla and Achilla. They sail from Centuria to Ephesus. He goes into the synagogue in Ephesus, and he tells them, I can't stay, but I'll be back. 18, he lands at Caesarea, and then he goes where? Up, up, up to Jerusalem to greet the church. And this is his fourth visit to Jerusalem. Now, Caesarea is on the coast. It is the uh, Herod's uh, headquarters. Caesarea, Caesarea, Caesarea. Well, it doesn't show there, but it should be right. Oh, there it is, Caesarea which is the uh, home of the uh, procurator. Um, so they make a short visit to uh, Jerusalem. Um, one sentence, it says he greeted the church, and then he went to Antioch back to his home base. Okay, that brings us uh, to the end of the second missionary journey. Before we start the third missionary journey, why don't we take a short break and uh, We'll come back in 10 minutes, um, and we'll take up the third missionary journey.